Our Community Needs Project is Mental Health Follow-Up Appointments Post-Discharge by Alexis Bell, Tammy Fields, Josie Krakora, Alexis Roder, and Haley Wagner. The need of a follow-up in mental health after being discharged is looking at having any mental illness. In 2021, it was found that 22.8% of U.S. adults age 18 and older have a mental illness. With this, uh, mental health illnesses are higher in females than males. With age 18 to 25 years old being the highest prevalence of 33.7%. We are looking with this project at adult patients with mental illness transitioning to community care after discharge from an inpatient psych unit. So there's currently no follow-up visits with an occupational therapist for participants post-discharge from an inpatient psych facility, specifically looking at the Evansville State Hospital. The need of a follow-up in mental health after being discharged is looking at having any mental illness. In 2021, it was found that 22.8% of U.S. adults age 18 and older have a mental illness. With this, uh, mental health illnesses are higher in females than males. With age 18 to 25 years old being the highest prevalence of 33.7%. We are looking with this project at adult patients with mental illness transitioning to community care after discharge from an inpatient psych unit. So there's currently no follow-up visits with an occupational therapist for participants post-discharge from an inpatient psych facility, specifically looking at the Evansville State Hospital. The area of mental health aligns with the occupational therapy framework through social participation, which can improve community participation, family participation, and friendship, work through employment seeking and acquisition, IADLs, through financial management, home establishment and management, and safety maintenance, and health management, through medication management, and social and emotional promotions and maintenance. A little history of the Evansville State Hospital was it was founded in 1890 and originally called the Southern Indiana Hospital for the Insane. It officially opened in October the 30th 1890 and had two patients. By 1954, it was packed with an estimated 1,500 patients. Around this time is when it changed its name to Woodmere to reduce the stigma associated with insane and to promote a more serene environment for the patients. The staff required the patients to maintain the gardens, orchards, poultry, and dairy operations, which had the hospital self-sustaining. The faculty felt that the patients needed to stay busy because it helped their mental state. It was also an amusement park and a railroad company which was called the Dummy Railroad on the land and the estate which allowed the public to view the estate and the outside part perimeter of the, the hospital. In 1943, an employee set one of the buildings on fire and it killed eight patients. The employee was later de detained and became a patient at the facility. And the, during this fire, it destroyed a portion of the administrative building, but it was rebuilt later that same year. Just a picture of an undated uh, flyer for the dummy railroad and of the hospital, the outside part of the 
the hospital. Resources to support. First, we defined the need. Through our research, we found that there is a lack of occupational therapy care in a mental health care setting due to laws regarding state level reimbursement. We also found that mental health and substance abuse are the top two problems in Vanderburg County. As we started to identify the severity of the need and its impact on our area, we found that 85% of the Hoosier population lives in an area with a mental health shortage and that Indiana ranks 42nd when it comes to mental health on a scale where a higher number equals a worse ranking. Community resources include the Peace Zone, who has helped over 500 individuals in 2015. This is a peer-led facility where anybody with a mental health disorder can come and relate to other peers who also struggle with similar disorders. NAMI, they have a free family and peer support group, a free family education class, Southwestern, they have a jail-based competency program, an assertive community treatment and supervised group living, as well as community-based programs. Some um, national statistics include one in five U.S. adults experience mental illness each year, one in 20 U.S. adults experience serious mental illness each year, and two in five people who are incarcerated have a history of mental illness. 37% of these are in state and federal prisons, and then 44% are held in local jails. So for the WHO, we decided on Evansville State Hospital staff and board members, social services, state and federal agencies, and the elected and appointed officials. In regards to the how for the health promotion and disease prevention for a person, we said one-on-one -on -one follow up can increase safety awareness and emotional regulation, home establishment, work establishment, and a reduction in readmission rates. And then for the group, we said increase social participation and mentorship through group interventions for follow up and population we said legislation, advocacy for OT profession, and community education to promote awareness and reduce the stigma. There are community resources available to those with mental illnesses in the community of Evansville, such as Peace Zone and National Alliance on Mental Illness. However, none of these have occupational therapists on staff or as volunteers at this time. Uh, the, peers, the Peace Zone is a peer-run mental health and or addiction recovery support system. So this is specifically support for those who have mental health and addiction run by those of similar ages. Um, NAMI is a mental illness support group, and in my experience, um, they actually go to hospitals and have support groups in the hospital and help and hand out um, resources for them for when they leave the psych hospital. Um, I'm at a psych hospital in Rhode Island right now, and they come every week and talk to our patients and give them resources for when they leave. Another community resource available within Evansville is the Ascension Behavioral and Mental Health Care. It offers a variety of mental health services, including individual counseling, family counseling, medication management, and behavioral health diagnostic assessments and evaluations. They have a care team that includes psychologists, psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, social workers, nurses, therapists, and other behavioral health specialists. It does not specify if they have occupational therapists on staff for mental and behavioral health needs. Deaconess Behavioral Health offers individual mental health evaluation and diagnoses, mental health urgent care, medication management, 
group therapy, and addiction services, but does not include occupational therapy as a resource offered for mental health needs. Another community resource that was already touched on before is Southwestern Behavioral Health Care. They have a crisis stabilization unit, and there's their address and phone number. They also have a mobile crisis unit, which is pretty neat. Um, they co-respond with the police to 911 calls that are related to somebody in a mental health crisis. They also offer services for addiction, aging adults. They offer a jail-based competency program, community-based therapy, and supervised group living. And these are where a lot of the people from the Evansville State Hospital are discharged to. Our stakeholder was Miranda Coley. She is an occupational therapist at the Evansville State Hospital. The admissions and adult continuing treatment, there are 134 beds. And for the geriatrics and medically fragile, there are 34 beds. Um, she is the only OT on staff and they just recently added an OTA and she's been working there for five years. Some questions that we had for our stakeholder included, but are not limited to, what are the funding challenges for providing a follow-up appointment after discharge? Who would be providing our patient mental health? Would this have to be a totally different organization? Would it need to be a different provider at another location or facility? Um, is there any sort of follow-up program currently in place? What are the barriers to receiving care, such as provider change from inpatient to outpatient? Is there medication costs, insurance coverage, transportation, social and economic status? What are the log logistical challenges, such as the provider changing from inpatient to outpatient, appointments over Zoom or in person? How are these patients getting to their appointments? Um, there's a lot of patients in mental health that are homeless, and they may or may not be able to have transportation to get to their appointments, or they might not have internet for Zoom. So these are all things to look at and consider when setting this up for a patient. What does the treatment plan, plan look like at discharge? Are there any plans set up for safety for after they leave here? And what sort of readmission factors fall into the readmission rate? Additional stakeholder questions that we had were which mental health disorders tend to have the higher readmission rate and is there a trend to this? What barriers do your clients face when returning to the community? What is your view of the history of stigma within the community? As a mental health clinician, pre and post COVID, how has society changed in terms of integration for those with mental health disorders into the community? Family involvement prior to discharge, or does the facility supply interactions with the family to be able to reintegrate with the family? Differences in patients' length of stay, and does the discharge location differ based on the type of admission, voluntary versus court order? In preparation for our stakeholder interview, we planned what we would say to our stakeholder to introduce ourselves, but we were lucky to be able to interview an occupational therapist in a mental health setting, so we did not feel the need to explain OT in detail. We did, however, include this information about our project in the initial email that we sent to the stakeholder. So some laws and regulations related to this matter include the Occupational Therapy Mental Health Parity Act. So this act looks to, is trying to remove any barriers that occupational therapists face when trying to treat somebody with a mental health disorder. 
Then there's the follow-up after psychiatric hospitalization. Um, and Medicare is looking to adapt this outcome measure from the FUH, which is follow-up after hospitalization for mental illness. So this will expand the kind of providers that can see a patient for a follow-up appointment um, after an acute stay in a psychiatric facility. So that'll just give them a more wider variety of people that they can see afterwards. And then this also will be more applicable to a broader patient population because it will include people with substance use disorder, which very much coincides with mental health disorders. In summary, there is a stigma towards mental health. Occupational therapy is not covered by insurance for mental health care, and there are logistical challenges due to the length of stay and HIPAA, and there is slow access to services, and after COVID, it has even been slower. So it's just been really hard to even get these types of services. And then there's also just the lack of occupations to address self-harm and the cost of prescriptions. So what we discovered from the stakeholder interview with feasibility is that this fact, this facility specifically has a no contact for 30 days post discharge meaning the patient cannot contact the facility for 30 days after being discharged, but also the facility cannot contact the patient for 30 days after discharge. Um, we also found out that they may have a follow-up program with social work, but there's nothing set up with occupational therapy at this facility. Um, prescriptions are expensive, so it's hard for patients to have these prescriptions when they are discharged. It's difficult for these patients to maintain job and housing, such as think about like when they are in this facility for an extended amount of time, they're not able to keep their job if they're in a mental health place for 30 or more days, their boss is gonna have to hire somebody and they're gonna lose their job. Same with housing. If they're not able to make these payments, then they're going to lose their housing. Um, their support system, a lot of patients here in mental health burn those bridges with their families and lose that, and they don't have a great support system. So this also goes into a lot of things and how likely they are to have relapses and everything when they don't have that support system. Mental health stigma has gotten better since COVID, but it still needs improvement. So we need to continue to advocate for mental health and help eliminate that stigma so that patients can get the help they need and not have that stigma over their heads and be afraid of talking about it and um, talking to people about it because that's something that helps people in their healing process. The summary of the stakeholder interview let us see that the impact of addressing the need could potentially decrease the rate of readmission and increase the success of patients' reintegration into the community post-discharge. Some other important information we obtained from our stakeholder interview includes tips for occupational therapists working in a mental health setting, such as burnout prevention, the risks of on-the-job injury, and the importance of self-care. 
we found that at the Evansville State Hospital, there are no productivity requirements for OTs, which is nice considering that most OTs in our profession have the goal of at least 80% productivity, if not more. One of the biggest barriers to care that our stakeholder informed us about is the patient's mindset. If a patient thinks that they do not have a problem or thinks that there is nothing wrong with them, they don't think that they need treatment to get better, when in reality, they're not going to get better without treatment. And also that if a patient is told they have to be admitted for 30 days, they might focus on how they could be getting out in 30 days and not on getting the treatment they need to get better within those 30 days, which could ultimately lead to an extended admission time. My article was titled Experiences of People with a Personality Disorder or Mood Disorder Regarding Carrying Out Daily Activities Following Discharge from Hospital. This is a level of evidence 2A according to the American Occupational Therapy Association. After obtaining ethical approval from the National Health Service, the authors explored the experiences of 16 patients that had a mood and or personality disorder following discharge from a hospital in relation to participating in daily activities. The inclusion criteria included adults aged 18 to 65 who utilized secondary mental health services, were discharged from the hospital in the last six months, and who were not in an acute or critical phase of illness. People who did not speak English as their first language and who would need an interpreter were excluded. Pseudonyms were assigned for participant anonymity. Interviews were recorded via digital audio recorder and then transcribed verbatim, each lasting 30 to 45 minutes. Themes include longer term goals, the consequences of long admissions on daily life, activities that people would like to do better post discharge from hospital, the cumulative effect of multiple admissions on activities of daily living, and social isolation reducing activities in the first few months post discharge. Sub themes include self care, parenting role, and developing routine. The authors utilize their findings to develop an intervention to increase occupational performance from this population. The article I looked at was specifically looking at post-discharge contact with mental health clinics and the amount of psychiatric readmission. Um, it's a six-month follow-up study. The level of evidence was 2A. The type of study was qualitative. And this article looked at the purpose Sorry, this article looked at discovering the association between continuing care and time to rehospitalization and what the predictors of time to first outpatient contact after discharge from a psychiatric hospital. Researchers found participants through the records of, um, of a hospital and um, this occurred from January 1st to December 31st, and if they, re if they returned within 180 days of discharge, then it was considered rehospitalization. Um, so if they came after that, it wasn't considered rehospitalization, but if they returned within the 180 days, then they considered it a rehospitalization from the prior visit. They found that out of 908 patients, 29% of them were rehospitalized. 59% visited an outpatient clinic. And out of the 59 that visited a clinic, 22% of them were rehospitalized. 40% of the of those did not visit a clinic. My article was titled Effective Mental Health Interventions to Reduce Hospital Readmission Rates, and it was a systematic review. The level of evidence was a 1A, and it was a qualitative systematic review. So the summary was that the purpose of the study was to establish whether specific interventions designed towards treating mental health symptoms for physical health conditions 
can effectively decrease hospital readmissions following hospitalization. So there was peer-reviewed articles within the systematic review and 13 of the studies were utilized based on inclusion criteria and 1,017 participants were screened at the abstract and title level. The evidence was mixed in regard to mental health strategies as a mechanism to decrease readmission rates, but however, evidence was found that mental health strategies can effectively decrease physical health readmission in the post-discharge period. So the literature does support the idea of utilizing mental health strategies after hospital discharge, but there's still limited research available to determine if mental health interventions do decrease 30-day readmission rates. My article was titled Hospitalization Patterns Over 30 Years Across a Statewide System of Public Mental Health Hospitals, Readmission Predictors, Optimal Follow-Up Periods, Readmission Clusters, and Individuals with Statistically Significant High Healthcare Utilization. This was a level of evidence 2B and it was a quantitative study that included 250,091 adult patients across the state of Texas over a 30-year period from 1987 to 2016. The study examined the pattern of psychiatric hospitals over 30 years across the Texas public mental health hospitals. The information examined included follow-up periods to reassess readmission, predictors of readmission, criteria for defining individuals with statistically significant high health care utilization, and distinct patterns that may exist among those that are readmitted. The total number of previous hospitalizations and diagnosis of schizophrenia was the largest predictor for the voluntary readmission, and major depressive for protective factors were the strongest predictors of readmission. Patients with multiple admissions accounted for 50% of all hospital admissions, and most readmissions occurred within the first 30 days after discharge from the hospital. My research article is titled Predictors of Outpatient Mental Health Clinic Follow-Up After Hospitalization Among Medicaid Enrolled Adults. So the participants, there were 1,177 people aged 18 to 26 who had completed at least one episode of inpatient mental health care between October of 2005 and September of 2006 at either a general or psychiatric hospital, and they were also enrolled in Medicaid. So this study used a logistic regression to assess demographic and clinical predictors of the likelihood that a person with a recent psychiatric hospitalization would attend a follow-up appointment within 30 days after their discharge. It was found that only 51% of the participants had a follow-up within 30 days of discharge. So these people leave a very structured environment and go to live independently or partially independently in a group home. And if they're not going to these follow-up appointments, that's just going to raise their readmission rate. It was found that black persons and persons with substance dis use disorder had a lower probability of attending their follow-up appointment, but those who had previously used outpatient mental health services actually had a higher likelihood of attending their follow-up appointment. The study supports the need for outpatient transition services and follow-up. The strength of our evidence put together with all of our articles was moderate. At least one level 1A or level 
1B was high quality study or it was a multiple moderate quality study. The available evidence is sufficient to determine the effects on health comes, but confidence in the estimate is constrained due to the number, size, or quality of individual studies or the inconsistency of findings across individual studies. So as more information becomes available, the direction or magnitude of the observed effect could change, and this change may be large enough to alter the conclusion related to the usefulness of the intervention. So there is a lack of evidence, but hopefully as this is researched more, um, the strength of evidence will become better. A solution to our issue of having not having anything post-discharge from a psychiatric hospital um, would be to create a community reintegration program. This program would have coordination between the program and the Evansville State Hospital. Um, this would be where the Evansville State Hospital notifies the program before a patient discharges and um, they will be able to be within the discharge planning process maybe even start at admission and evaluation to Evansville State Hospital for their and their within their discharge planning have somebody from the community reintegration program within these plans to help have a smoother transition into the community and into the program post discharge. So um, the discharge meetings would include all of the treating team members and as well as have people from the community reintegration program. This is to aim improvement within the patient's social participation, their work, their IADLs, and health management once discharged. Um, and the OT would be from the reintegration program can talk to the OT within the Evansville State Hospital to give them ideas of community, community reintegration interventions to be able to complete with their patient before they even leave their facility. So how an occupational therapist can consult on this matter in terms of a person, group, and population level. So for a person, the OT can conduct an initial interview and review of their history. For an individual who has just been discharged from the inpatient psychiatric hospital to determine what areas of occupation they struggle with the most and then the OT can use that information to decide which occupations are most important to the person and most needed for their success and community reintegration. At the group level the OT can help create a life skills and social interaction group that teaches or reteaches persons with mental illness how to perform basic life tasks such as money management, home maintenance, self-care, etc. Providing this in a group setting will also allow for that social interaction between persons to increase social skills needed for reintegration into the community. At the population level, the OT can create a medication or appointment log for patients to fill out once they leave the inpatient psychiatric hospital. This can help them keep track of their medications and appointments, and then they can bring this log to the community program or their outpatient mental health provider to keep them accountable. And typically these people will be discharged to a group home, so whoever's there at the group home can maybe help them um, fill it out so we can let them know that they have this log and just keep them accountable and taking their medications and helping them fill that out.
professionals and credentials that may be beneficial to the proposed community reintegration program includes advanced certifications the home and community safety and driving professional certificate which is offered by the american occupational therapy association this covers a broad range of topics important for occupational therapy practitioners working with community dwelling adults there's another course offered by the american occupational therapy association called Participation, Resilience, and Wellness, which is a micro-credential course bundle. It offers courses in Mindfulness for the Occupational Therapy Practitioner and the Client, a Needs Assessment and Group Leadership course, Routine, Occupational Balance and Health, Transportation and Occupation, Stress and Inflammation Management, Nutrition, Spirituality, and Sexuality. And other professionals that may be beneficial include a professional from a vocational rehab program to help with finding a job and working on work hardening skills, a social worker to help with funding, housing, or equipment, a physician or psychiatrist to help with medication management, a historian to help reintegrate into society after several years have passed, a lawyer for if the person has court needs or needs to file for temporary guardianship to be removed. And these are our references. Thank you for listening.